the ammo collection used to just sit on top of a cabinet and it was overflowing. I was going on the road and collecting, going to gun shows and stuff, and I would bring stuff home and throw it on the pile. Bring stuff home and throw it on the pile. So what I did since the pile was overflowing is put the pile into these drawers. And what we're going to do in this series of videos is explore the drawers. So let's get to it. We're putting away this one and going into the last drawer. The last video in the uh, ammo collection assortment, assorting, what are we calling this? I forgot what we're calling it. This one's pretty neat. This will be an interesting one. All right, so uh, this is the last drawer in the ammo collection. The coolest drawer? Probably. And uh, let's know what you think. So here we'll dig in. There's also the last drawer in this video, in this series, where we're going through the ammo collection and definitely have rethought everything about these drawers. Like, this is the worst system for putting an ammo collection in, period. Even if the drawers were strong enough to hold the weight, they're going to get all dusty in here. So it's just a bad choice. It was good for s sorting it. It got it off of the cabinet that everything was falling off of, but not great. So let's see. First off, we got this little guy who somebody gave me one time at the gun shop, and it's supposed to be a 22 automatic, which, well, there's debate on whether or not such a thing exists. Next, we have 50 cents for all of these brass cases. 50 cents. That's how I end up with a bunch of garbage I don't need. So yeah, that's pretty neat, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Future arts project, interesting collection display, who knows. Do you know what this is? This has a lot of significance to me. This is a chunk of a Titan II intercontinental ballistic missile silo. This is a chunk of a nine-story deep silo that used railroad rails as rebar for the concrete of the nine-story deep silo for a 40 megaton Titan II intercontinental ballistic missile that blew up in Arkansas. And when that silo, or when that missile blew up in the silo, there was other damage, and part of that damage was to throw chunks of concrete all around. And I got this kind of chunk of concrete from the property who now the person who now owns the property. That's awesome. I knocked some chunks off of it for people that uh, were interested in having a chunk of concrete from a Titan II intercontinental ballistic missile silo. I've got some other artifacts from Titan II silos in Arizona, but this is the only one I have from someplace outside of Arizona. So here's a little bag that I bought. It says $15. For some reason, I don't think I paid $15 for it. I probably paid less. But this is a whole assortment of 22s. That's right up my alley, and everything about this is cool. I probably have most of these, but just in case I didn't, I acquired this bag, and one day I'll go through the bag and look at the rest of them and see if there's anything that I can put in this collection. So this is a supplement to this, and then if nothing else, it's extras. All right, so uh, let's put some of this stuff back in. Underneath the here is the bag that some stuff came from from Ghost Town Custom Knives, so I don't think there's anything in it right now. This is... It looks like flints. Yeah, this is just a bunch of flints for a flintlock gun. Modern flints, so nothing fancy. This is a bag of balls. This will just be a bunch of lead balls. Yeah, a bunch of different shaped projectiles. You can't see in there. But a bunch of leather, just a leather bag full of different shaped projectiles. Now, this is an interesting little setup. So... I didn't have, I had one caseless projectile, which is in here, which is one of these. So Daisy made a VL caseless, and that stands for the guy that invented it. Um, so the VL used diesel. It would 
shove air through a small hole which would heat the air and that would ignite the white stuff on the end of these projectiles. The white stuff on the end of the projectiles was some sort of a gunpowder pellet type of thing and it was connected to the projectile. There is no case so this is not a firearm. This is taking hot air, there's no firing pin, there's taking hot air and shoving it through a small hole. Excuse me, it's just taking regular air. Shoving it through a small hole which creates heat that was enough heat to ignite the little pellet and then it would propel the, card, the, the projectile down the barrel. These were sold in straws like this. This is a bundle of however many it is, five straws. So they were sold in straws. These individual things were stacked into a straw and then those straws were in a box. So this is 100 projectiles for the VL caseless rifle. So these are 100 of these, so that would be 10 straws of 10 projectiles. So I only owned one projectile and I didn't know if this was going to be possible to own anything else. And then I was at, I don't know if it was the Tulsa show, I was at a gun show, I just can't remember which one anymore. And this was all sitting on a table and I go, how much is this? I won't tell you the price because I don't want anybody to have a fit. And then now I own this. So that's how cool is that? Number one, I'm a big fan of stuff that complies yet creates precedent to remove the NFA and the 68 Gun Control Act. Awesome example of something that complies with law yet challenges the reasoning for the perception that gun owners are somehow violent or something because we own property. And this mechanism is just ingenious and neat. Doesn't need a firing pin. Imagine the evolution of something that doesn't need the case. What if the projectile was ceramic? Think of the project. Think of think of this with eighty percenters, eighty percent firearms or firearms that you print. Make your own firearm. This kind of projectile it removes a whole other layer of the equation with the case. For whatever reason, the ATF considered this a firearm and ended its use. But uh, So these things don't exist anymore, and only so many of them were made. They weren't rare, but you don't see them every day. And when you do, some people think they're made out of gold or something. The story's interesting. It's not that interesting. So some of this will be going for auction. I don't need to own all of it. It is fun to have it for the collection and stuff, so I'll probably keep a straw and a couple, but I don't need to keep it all. Uh, and then this little container is full of um, um, why can't I think of what these things are called? Uh, why can't I think of flechettes? Because I couldn't think of the word. So flechettes are amazing. And this is a little a number of them. Uh, at some point I owned way more than that. And they're little tiny darts made for doing horrible things in munitions and ordnance. So imagine how horrible these little darts could be to everything, to literally everything. So horrible little things. They're not really ammunition, they're more like ordnance, but they're interesting and it, there was a time when you could acquire these things fairly inexpensively and they're super neat. They're like nails, except they got fins. So they're just cool, super cool. Uh, then we got a bunch of different uh, 22 stuff here it looks like some uh, ram set stuff some kind of a box There's probably nothing interesting about this box just some box that's inside of a bag inside of a bag with some foam oh looks like there's a bunch of different uh, small stuff in here so we have everything from two millimeter pin fire uh, this is basically all the extras to the big selection here and this is what I used to keep the collection in, a little tiny box like this. These are not secrets boxes, these are little radioactive boxes that I got from a factory, Raytheon, here in Air T Tucson, that made Tomahawk missiles, air-to-air -air missiles, and uh, they sold off a bunch of their tooling and toolboxes. So this ammo collection, for a little while, for years actually, lived in a toolbox from Raytheon. So this am I ammo collection used to live in a toolbox that held parts for Tomahawk missiles. That was kind of neat. But somewhere around mid-2000s, I outgrew that box.
long, long time ago. Do I have it anymore? I don't even know if I have it anymore. It was kind of fragile also, and the ammo was really taken and beating it. It was really beating it up. This was an attempt at putting the small stuff into an interesting uh, display. So I had this case that has glass in it, a little bit of card corrugated paper, cardboard under there. And the idea was to try to keep all these ammos in here in an interesting way. But as you can see, they just all move around. The ones that are bigger than the others create a place for the little ones to get around. And they all just went wild. So this is one of, at the time at least, one of all of my small stuff. And it looked pretty neat, I think. There must be a picture of it on Instagram or something. You can tell right on top of the patch is one of the tiny little 223s. Tiny little 556. Five, so, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of little stuff in here. The smallest practical actual thing is the 2 millimeter pin fire, but I have a lot of small... Everything in here except for that one thing is a live round. There might be one 22 dummy in here, but otherwise uh, that's the only non-firing round. Everything else in here is a thing. Well, some of them are planks, I guess. But most of them are uh, going to make noise or shoot something out of them, even though they're tiny. Let's see, the last thing I have in this drawer, because it's the cool stuff, is this little chunk of lead. And this is just a little strip of lead. But this little strip of lead comes from our tour of the Hornady factory. When we're watching how Hornady's ammo is created, one of the processes is to take this strip of lead and to, you know, have it chopped into smaller pieces and then create bullets out of it, obviously. But uh, this little piece uh, was kind of set in there in a scrap bin. And as we were doing the tour, the guy wouldn't let me take any photographs or any video or anything. So I asked, hey, is it okay if I grab one of these little pieces of lead as a souvenir? And he allowed me to grab it. So that's my souvenir from the Hornady factory, a little piece of lead that uh, is off of a big spool of lead. That is what they make the projectiles out of. All right, hopefully that was an interesting series. It took me all afternoon, really, to go through this. And I don't know how long it'll take to edit everything. I probably won't put a lot of frills in the editing. But uh, give us some feedback. Um, I'm going to, at some point, take everything out of these drawers, figure out a much better, bigger set of drawers probably to put it into, and I could do another set of videos then. But I really would like to take some time and uh, uh, sort, sort again, uh, and then figure out what's extra so I can get rid of the extra stuff or start trading some of the extra stuff and get more variety. I'm all about variety over... Uh, quality, let's put it that way. I don't care if I have a rusty version of a caliber, if I can have two or three rusty versions of three different calibers, I'd rather have that than one fancy version of one caliber. So, uh, yeah, let us know what your feelings are after watching all this. Uh, as far as ammo collecting, if you've made some videos about ammo, link them up so that we can uh, check them out, maybe do some trading. And till next time, thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments which one of the videos in this series you like best. So let us know what you think. We'll be watching the comments wherever you find the video over on GunStreamer.com or on GunTube.org. Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The, the guys and gals of GunWebsites.com encourages you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thank you for watching GunWebsites.com.